Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and today we're going to talk about the opening of the fifth seal of judgment in Revelation and the blood of the martyrs. Before we jump in, if you missed the last video, be sure to go back and watch it. And while you're at it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video post. Not to mention, it really helps the channel when you subscribe. In fact, we are well on the way to 5,000 subscribers, and it would be incredible if you'd help us get there. Even more, there's something very supernatural that happens in our heart when we take a stand to let the world know that we've made the decision to believe God's word and stand on the side of Bible prophecy. Now, this is a great place to begin our conversation today. We've been talking about what the Apostle John saw as he was transported through a spiritual doorway into the very throne room of heaven. And the things that he saw should shake us to the very core of our being because God allowed him to see the judgment that's going to come on this world after the rapture of the church has taken place. Now, these judgments on the world are released through a succession of events that the Bible describes as the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, and these are described throughout the Bible as the wrath of the Lamb. In fact, the very first mention of this uh, can be found in Psalm chapter 2, which is a messianic psalm written by King David, uh, and for the sake of time, I'm only going to read the key segments of the passage, which says this, verse 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords away from us. Skipping down to verse four, he who sits in heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall hold them in derision, then he shall speak to them his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Now moving down to verse eight, it says this, and I will give you, speaking of Christ, the nations for your possession, and you shall break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. The prophet Isaiah describes this in Isaiah 11 when he says, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. In other words, at the end of the age when Jesus comes to establish his earthly kingdom, there will be no one on earth who can stand at his coming or have the strength to resist his righteous judgments. In fact, Revelation 6, 16 and 17 says this, Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their judgment has come, and who can withstand it? My point being that the judgments contained within the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls are very real events that can't be pushed to the side as something symbolic or as something representative. Now, there's a lot of misguided teaching on the book of Revelation because a lot of people view it as a symbolic illustration of the ongoing spiritual conflict between good and evil. Others view the book of Revelation as something that was fulfilled in the first three centuries AD through the destruction of Jerusalem or the fall of the Roman Empire. And then there's others who view the events in Revelation as something that has been progressively unfolding and predominantly fulfilled through the past 2,000 years of church history with only a few triv trivial things left for the generation that sees the return of the Lord. But the overarching fallacy with these perspectives is that they attempt to explain away the literalness of Jesus Christ standing in the throne room of heaven, opening the seals and unleashing judgment on the world. 
Now, I also believe that it's particularly important for people to recognize that what John saw in these visions made him an actual eyewitness to the end of the world from the vantage point of God's throne room. Now, let's get into our topic at hand today. The opening of the fifth seal judgment in Revelation 6, verse 9 through 11, which says this. When he, speaking of Jesus Christ, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls, or more literally the lives, of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. Now, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this text. And what initially hits me is that in comparison to the previous sealed judgments, This one doesn't really feel like a judgment in the same spirit as the releasing of demonic deception, war, famine, disease, and death that all come as the first four seals are opened. And the more I studied this passage out, the more I realized that I'm left wanting from most of the Bible commentaries on this passage because their varied exegesis and... Uh, uh, teachings from the scripture tends to focus on the symbolism within this text rather than on its more literal implications, which I don't necessarily think makes their observations wrong, but they're missing a major facet of what this passage is telling us. Here's what I think they miss, though. According to the creation account in Genesis 2, when God made man, He formed his body from the dust of the earth, right? Then he breathed into him the breath of life or spirit. And when the physical body created from the dust and that breath of life directly from God connected, the Bible tells us that man became a living soul. Now, the soul comprises your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions, essentially everything that defines who you are as an individual, while the spirit is the breath from God, that gave you life. And according to scripture, when someone dies, their body's buried, right? Because it comes from the earth. That's why at every funeral, we commit someone's body to the ground. Yet the moment someone dies, the eternal aspects of their being, which is their spirit and soul, are still very much alive and they're taken to heaven or hell based entirely on that person's response to Jesus Christ. And the reason this happens is because our spirit originated with God, so it has to return to the spirit realm. Think about it. When God wanted plants and animals, what did he do? He spoke to the earth. When he wanted fish, he spoke to the water. When he wanted birds, he spoke to the sky. And while no one can argue that all of these living things are precious to God and that they're very much alive. According to Matthew 10, 29, the Bible tells us that God sees and knows the fate of a single sparrow because he truly cares that deeply. But none of these other aspects of creation were given an eternal breath of life, and because of it, their existence is completely anchored to this natural world. And so when they die, there's no eternal aspect of their life to live on. In contrast, as humans, we're unique because we're the only part of creation that finds its life vitally connected to two worlds, the natural world and the spiritual world. Now stay with me because I'm going somewhere. My point is this that something beyond our capacity to really understand takes place when someone is killed for their testimony of faith in Jesus Christ or their obedience to God's word. And according to scripture, their death carries a very tangible voice from earth 
a voice that carries feeling, a voice that carries thought, a voice that remembers the experience, and it carries that very tangible essence from earth into heaven, and their cries are literally being stored under the altar in heaven. Now, if you remember back in Genesis 4 verse 10, uh, the story of Cain and Abel, but Cain murdered his brother Abel because he was jealous, right, of his righteousness before God. And when God confronted Cain, he says, what have you done? Listen to this. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You know, we talk about the omniscience of God as being one of his immutable characteristics. And in other words, God knows everything. And because of that, he sees and hears things that are beyond the frequency of this natural world. Now, hold that thought and shift gears with me for a moment because I need to address a false doctrine that's crept into portions of the church and it's called soul sleep. Now, this erroneous belief is the concept that when someone dies, their soul goes into a kind of suspended animation where they have no awareness or consciousness and it's based on the false belief that the soul does not exist apart from the body. Again, this is, a, this is wrong and it is not taught in the Bible. According to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, remember we said that in creation, God formed our body from the dust of the earth. He breathed into it the breath of life and man became a living soul. In other words, the soul, which is your mind, will, intellect, and emotions is a product of the breath of life coming into your body, which is why it remains connected to your spirit when you die. See, it's not a product of the body, it's a product of the spirit coming into the body. Now, I think you'll find this interesting. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14 through 17, the Bible says this, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Did you see that? God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet them in the air. So how can the Lord bring the dead with him in verse 14 and also come to get them in verse 16? See, it's because the righteous dead are in two places. Remember, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the soul and spirit of the righteous dead are already with the Lord, but their bodies are in the grave. That's why at the rapture, Christ brings with him the dead who are already in his presence so that they can get their resurrected bodies from the grave and then be glorified with us who are still alive and caught up. Now, let's look back at our text in Revelation 6. It says this, when he, again speaking of Christ, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, For how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. Now, the question, who are the souls under the altar in Revelation 6 as the Lamb opens the fifth seal, 
is one of those topics that's highly debated among biblical scholars. And their issue is this. Do these souls under the altar represent those who will give their life to the Lord during the tribulation and as a result are killed by the Antichrist for their faith? Or do these souls under the altar represent all those throughout the ages who forfeited their life because of their obedience to God's word and their faith in Christ? Now, strangely, I've found that very few biblical scholars answer this question by saying both. Despite the fact that the text itself doesn't really give us any expanded explanation regarding their identity. And these same scholars spend a considerable amount of time comparing and or contrasting the golden altar of incense with the altar for burnt offerings. Now, again, let me point out that the Bible doesn't directly tell us which altar is being referenced here. The problem, though, is that all these scholars' conclusions uh, are based on which altar they believe the text is talking about. In fact, they spend most of their time focusing on the symbolism or focusing on the altar, which I believe is very real, but again, the Bible doesn't tell us which one. And frustratingly, I've read so many contradictory views on the symbolism in this passage that I came to the conclusion that, you know, whenever you see all this confusion and scholars can't agree on is it this or is it that, I, I began looking at the text through fresh eyes and I realized that most of these scholars are missing the fundamental point of the passage, which is this that every single one of these martyrs whose souls are under the altar in heaven are lives that were poured out through history in sacrifice to God as they were put to death, murdered, and even slaughtered for entertainment because of their righteousness. These are, and, and, and think about this, for perspective, I read an article from Christianity Today that was published in June of 2014 that puts the number of Christians martyred since the time of Jesus at more than 70 million people. And I find it interesting that these martyrs, the Bible tells, uh, the Bible says that they're going to be joined, that the number of their brethren is not complete. And yet at this point, the rapture of the church has taken place and the tribulation is begun, which means that there are more that are going to be martyred throughout the tribulation. See, my answer is both, but the focus of this passage is not the altar. The focus of this passage are the martyrs. And remember, even though these martyrs, the ones that are under the altar crying out, they're already with the Father in heaven. None of these people have received the full measure of justice from God that scripture foretells. The Gospel of Matthew in chapter 12 tells us uh, concerning Christ. Here is my servant who I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Yet justice has not been given to these martyrs from times past. The book of Nahum 1.3 says this, The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. And in Deuteronomy 32, the Bible tells us that God will repay the evil done to his people, that he will give them vindication, and that he will avenge the blood of his servants. So then as Jesus opens the fifth seal uh, in the tribulation, the souls of those martyred begin to ask God, how long will he wait before avenging their deaths? And the Lord gives each of them a white robe and tells them to rest a little longer until the full number of their brethren is reached. Now, the early church, and you can find this uh, all th through all kinds of writings uh, on this topic, 
is the early church believed that there was a designated number of martyrs, and when that number was reached, then God would begin to judge. Now, the phrase that they should rest a little longer literally means that they should be at peace. And the question is, why should they be at peace? Well, they should be at peace because they've been clothed in righteousness, and that even though there will be more in the years that are coming that will suffer their same fate, that God knows, that God hears their cry, and that he will give them justice before this age comes to an end. Now think about this. The Bible tells us that God made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel, which basically means that it's entirely possible to know God, but that the majority of people will only relate to God through what he does outwardly. And in relation to what we're talking about, I really believe that most people are confused about God's apparent slowness in responding to great evil, right? And if we're being honest, most of us have at one time or another had very strong feelings about how God should be doing things when we see evil taking place on this earth. Am I right? I mean, wouldn't life be easier if evil men and their actions were immediately judged by God? And wouldn't life be easier if every act of righteousness or faith in our lives were instantly rewarded by God? And I don't know how. Maybe God's sending you a big check in the mail or some kind of great public recognition. I mean, wouldn't that make life a whole lot easier? But the truth is, God isn't quick to judge evil or reward righteousness. And the best way to explain this is, I think, by using the illustration of filling a cup to represent the motivations and actions of our lives before the Lord. For example, if you remember in the 23rd Psalm, David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. The cup that David was talking about was a cup that was filled with faith and it overflowed with goodness and mercy. On the other hand, in Romans 2, 5, the apostle Paul writes this, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath. Listen to that. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. So when Jesus tells these souls under the altar to rest a little longer until the full number of their brethren is reached, what he's saying is that the cup of judgment for this sin isn't full yet. But when the appointed number of martyrs is reached, in that moment, judgment will come. Now, I don't know how many people are going to come to the Lord during the tribulation or how many of them are going to be killed for their faith. But I believe it's possible that when the two witnesses from Revelation 11 are killed just days before the tribulation ends, that it's their death that ultimately fills the cup of God's wrath when it comes to this. Now let's stop there for today. But before we go, I believe it's important for everyone to remember that we are not living in the tribulation. We are still living in this age of grace. And no matter what you've done, there is still time to fill your cup with the goodness and mercy of God. If you remember, when Jesus was crucified, one of the thieves that was crucified next to Jesus had come to the end of a life that was full of wickedness and sin and I don't know, he must have heard Jesus on the cross say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because as this thief hung there, 
with death literally moments away. His cup filled to the brim with sin. He turned to Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And all it took was an honest heart of repentance for God to empty his cup from the sin and from the wrath that he had filled it with for his entire life. And in turn, God filled it with goodness and mercy. Listen, whatever life you're living, your cup is not full yet. And there's still time to empty it of sin and the consequences that come from it. By asking God to forgive you, and there's still time to fill your cup with the goodness and mercy of God. Let's pray. Father, I ask right now that every person watching would recognize and realize that we are living in the time of grace. And Father, it's not your will that any of us go through the great tribulation. It's not your will that any of us, God, would suffer this wrath. And Father, we live in a time, God, where your goodness and mercy and the free favor of God is flowing towards every one of us. And right where you're at, if your life is not right with God, if you've been living in sin and you've been experiencing the consequences of that, I encourage you to empty your cup in repentance. Just call out to God and say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Empty my cup from the wrath that's being stored for that day and God, fill it with your mercy and your grace. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you next time.